Good morning, good morning, good morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Another lovely morning in paradise. Had a good day at work yesterday. I've got to... Uh, if you want to have a good day at work, my tip to you is to get a scanner. Get a scanner. Get the fastest scanner you can you can afford. Because you'll it'll be your friend for life, and I literally mean every day of your life. Everything that comes over your desk, scan it. If it's an invoice, enter it into the accounts and scan it. And then shred everything. And then just keep uh, the things that you can't scan. Things like uh, certificates and uh, uh, you know signed legal contracts and possibly catalogues and things. Put those in a filing cabinet. You'll get about one drawer's worth a year. And uh, oh, God, I'm so rich, my money's clattering about. And then um, <clears throat> anything uh, you want to refer to is just literally like a, a few clicks away because it's all scanned and scan it all in PDF format. I've got a Kodak i1440 or something. It's a, it's a very, very fast, like industrial scanner. It scans, it scans, uh, it's quicker than one page a second. It's a two or three pages a second. And it scans uh, in color, it scans both sides of the paper. It's very quick. And uh, you know, you could, I, I wouldn't think twice about putting 40, 50 pages double-sided through that scanner and uh, and uh, takes takes a few minutes just to clear my desk and uh, and then if I need anything like yesterday for example I um, it's my year end on the 30th of September so uh, I'm busy uh, making sure the accounts are in order before I send them to the accountant and so <clears throat> We have all our accounts are, uh, every transaction is categorized by class, by, it has a class attached to it. So, for example, if it's one of my lab bills, it'll be class Derek. And if it's one of the other, uh, if it's like an uh, associate's lab bill or a hygienist lab bill, it'll have class hygienist on it. Or if it's a repair, it'll, <clears throat> if it's a scaler, it'll have class hygienist on it, attached to it. <clears throat> it's a secondary characteristic of the transaction and that means that I can pull out management accounts which are categorized by class and I can see immediately where the profit centers are, where the loss centers are. Um, so that's the great thing about management accounts. They give you results far, far earlier than your accountant will and in, in much greater detail. Um, by which I don't mean that they're more accurate, they're less accurate but Allowing for the inaccuracies, you get the information that you want. So I had to reclassify some of the income because when the payments are made across the counter, they're all put in as practice income. But then every month the hygienist uh, tells me how much she's grossed, which we agree with her, and then pay a net. And so her her, her uh, contractual payments go out net, uh, her net contractual payments are paid out and they are so, they're, they're given the class hygienist so they show us uh, wages in effect, uh, they're on the wages line, they're not wages, she's self-employed but they're shown on the wages line of the uh, management profit and loss and then um, what I'd like to know is how much money she's brought in, you know, what, what her gross is and so what I have to do is I have to reallocate some of the uh, practice income to the hy to hygienist income, so we know how much was hygienist income. And in order to do that, I know I need to know what her gross what gross she's claimed for the past 12 months. And in order to do that, I need to pull up her invoices for the last 12 months just to get the gross figure off, so that I can transfer it across. And sure enough, if everything's scanned, it's it's uh, easy peasy. So. Um, so um, yeah, so yesterday I, um, well day before yesterday uh, I put, to put the car in for a repair, it just had a major service and um, then the steering got very stiff so I took it in and they told me it was probably the uh, power steering pump failing and 
I don't know, what's he doing? Oh, there's a lot, there's a lot of work going on at the moment. And um, so we arranged to get a pump in and uh, get it, you know, fitted. Quoted me about 450 quid, which, you know, obviously I wasn't pleased about, but, uh, you know, it's, it's the thing with the car, isn't it? You know, you have to say, well, is the car worth the money that you're being asked to spend on it? And this, having just had a major service and actually which cost less than 450 quid, um, I decided obviously it was worthwhile getting this fixed. So, um, anyway, when it went in to have the pump fitted, they told me they'd put like a, what they call a senior tech or a master tech on it or something, which is basically a code name for a technician who knows what he's doing, as opposed to one who doesn't, you know, has just been told to measure the output pressure on the power steering pump and has come back saying that he thinks it's a bit low. Uh, and it turned out that there's a stiff joint on the um, in the steering train, so they've, they've got a sort of a universal joint, and apparently it hadn't been oiled, you know. So, <laughs> so they couldn't just oil it, could they? Oh no, they had to they had to replace the uh, the joint. But having said that, it came in about 150 quid instead of 450 quid. So of course, Q1 happy dentist. So. You know, and when when they rang and said, "Look, we're pleased to tell you the damage is not uh, what we thought," you know, and so we're we're going to change our minds and and say that you don't need this pump, even though we have ordered it in. Um, and uh, you know, we're going to charge you 300 quid less than we quoted. Obviously, I was very happy. You can never be completely happy because, as I say, this car's just had a major service, and although the steering was working at the time, it's a shame that. You know, uh, to be complete, I think if they'd said to me, "Yeah, this is not the not the sort of item that is checked at a major service, or that it's obviously just failed catastrophically," um, which it might have done because they said it was seizing up. So uh, I assumed it was seizing up because it wasn't lubricated, but it may have been seizing up because it had failed. Anyway, they replaced the joint, and um, I was happy with, because I think that there that was an ethical thing to do. You know. And that's the thing you get from a main dealer that you won't get perhaps from a, a smaller dealer. I mean, the reason why this Peugeot used to be maintained by my local Renault garage, and he's a small guy and, um, you know, a little, little one of these little back street, uh, single, single building, you know, uh, well, which you get all across France, you know, and all across the country, really, just these uh, little... Um, mechanics who buy uh, uh, sorry about the money they buy um, you know Chinese parts for your car and and don't charge as much as the main dealers but the trouble was that I was I was having I was having more trouble as a result of taking stuff to him because it wasn't getting fixed properly you know stuff was not not being done and uh, you know you take it in with three faults and two of them will get fixed and then the third one you say well have you done that and they're oh no I forgot about it you know I'm sorry I uh, didn't you know or we had a look and we, we couldn't find anything you know so and this car had a particular problem with um, when you turned on the uh, heating you've got a smell through the radiators and the uh, the small garage they told me it was probably a leak in the radiator it smelled like uh, antifreeze and of course the hot air would come through the radiator so if there's any anything leaking around the radiator then uh, could be uh, you're going to smell of leaking antifreeze through the heater so he gave me a bottle of um, radiator weld which is which is basically glue a crap that you pour in your radiator and it it's sort of supposed to circulate in the water and then when it when it it leaks out it gums up anything, it le any gap it leaks out of. It's a real, you know, put sawdust in the gearbox type fix to a, any sort of mechanical part engine. And I didn't use it because I honestly, I didn't think it was fair on the system, the water, the cooling system to tip this gunk in. Because once you've tipped it in, you can't, you can't get it out. It's like when you use one of those sprays to reinflate your tire, you know. And then you take it down the thing and say, "I've um, and I've kept the tire going because I've filled it up full of foam, 
and they were like that's it then there's no way we can repair it now because uh, you foamed it to death anyway so um, you know it got me thinking about whether there was any applications really of this ethical ethical trading to dentistry because and, and I don't mean that I was wondering whether their dentistry should be ethical because you know it goes without saying and the GDC would expect without question that every dentist should be completely ethical and there are a few different definitions of the word professional and uh, <clears throat> some people like think it's like a professional footballer or a professional wrestler or a professional athlete which means that you're you're being paid to do something you know you're not doing it voluntarily you're you're bit you know it's, it's a profession that you're but professional I've always understood in the medical context to mean something about ethics uh, basically what it means is that as a professional person you are um, obligated to put the interests of the patient above your own yeah and if you think about it in any field where there's a massive great um, imbalance of knowledge between the two parties um, then uh, one party is at, is at a severe disadvantage and I'll have to spend some some of the in the financial sector they place a great premium on um, equity in terms of access to knowledge um, well they say they do but um, you know but they the, the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Commodity Future Trading Commission and all those they're like well if, if, if an investor is investing in a company then they need to know exactly as much as the chief executive there should be no they should know apart from stuff which is literally you know uh, proprietary information or related to the current trading period which is just internal information that does not likely to affect the stock price in other words just trading as normal they say that anything out of the ordinary uh, must be known uh, so that people can take an informed decision about whether or not to buy or sell the shares they need to know if uh, the company's going bust or if the company's got a lot of debt on the books or if they're thinking of uh, merging or um, as in the case of Elon Musk um, thinking of taking the company private and at a certain share price and having secured the funding therefore causing the share price to to move towards the, the agreed price you know who's gonna shell who's gonna sell uh, a share in Tesla for uh, £3.70 when you know it's going to be bought out for four pound twenty a share. You know you're going to hang on for four pound twenty, aren't you? All of a sudden, that information is being factored into the price, and the price is going to go up to four twenty because that's what people expect they will be paid for those shares. So that's what got uh, Elon Musk into trouble. Um, again, you know, just mucking about with this asymmetry of information, saying that he knew something that the investors didn't, and in fact, it was something it, it was something that he didn't know. It was just. A joke, you know. It was just a 420s a marijuana, marijuana hashish reference, and he, and he and he was just been. He's probably high at the time. I don't know what. But anyway, it cost him about um, cost him a few tens of millions of pounds in fines, and uh, the shares went right down and right back up again. Not that I've got Tesla shares. I quite fancy having a Tesla, but I haven't got Tesla shares. So this this asymmetry of information, and in, in any professional relationship, there is an asymmetry of information. The uh, the professional has far more information than than the patient, yeah. And I know they say, well, you know, the patient's got to make the decisions, and this is an old argument, and it and it has been resolved, really. You know, this argument that you shouldn't you shouldn't make the decision for the patient. The patient should make the decision. And so what you have to do is you have to educate to the, the patient to the point where they've got as much information as they can cope with, which uh, will then allow them to decide what's best for them, you know, not, not what's best for you. And that's fair enough, despite the fact that some patients can't actually make it, make decisions, and they always end up saying to you, well, what would you do? Or, or, or they, say, they say, what do you think I should do? And I always say, I can't say what I think you should do, but I can say what I think I would do under the circumstances and then they they sort of go along with the gag they understand what you're trying to say that you can't tell them what to do but you can tell them what you do and then they therefore say well you know you know what you're talking about therefore I'm going to do what you said that you would do um, 
But um, that's the that's the definition of the word professional, as far as I'm concerned, is is putting the patient's interest before your own. And uh, and I think you know the, the whole gist of what I'm trying to say is that to what extent does that help you as a dentist, as a professional, to um, to to deal with patients? You know, supposing someone comes in and says. Uh, you know, I've got a problem tooth and, uh, you know, it's got toothache and you say, well, you're probably going to need a root treatment, it's going to cost you 450 quid, right? And then when you make an appointment for them to come in and you've allocated the time and everything and, and then you find out that the tooth, in fact, is vital and the pain has gone away and it tests okay on an electronic pulp tester and everything and so as far as you're, you know, if they'd come in like that originally, then you probably wouldn't have recommended a root treatment. So what do you do? Do you just carry on and do the root treatment anyway because they're expecting it and it's been planned and your overheads are going to tick up whether you do it or not, you know? Unfortunately, the answer in, in some cases is yes. Some dentists will do that. They just will do it, you know? It's unfortunate. I can't uh, hold the profession, the, the dental profession up against garages in terms of ethics because in both cases there are there are larger uh, concerns that probably would or wouldn't and then the smaller businesses that probably would or wouldn't. So, you know, it's just human nature, isn't it? It's not dental nature or mechanics nature. It's just how you want to live your life, what rules you want to play by. It's whether you can sleep at night, not... Uh... Uh, and also, I think, to a certain extent, you know, that, that goes a long way. I mean... I am going to, I, I prepared to drop my trousers every time I go to a main dealer with a car because um, they are, to a certain extent, they're inspected and tested and their compliance costs are higher plus their equipment costs are higher because they have to have all the gear that that is recommended by the car manufacturer that does the job properly. They can't buy Chinese equipment, they can't buy Chinese parts, they have to buy properly franchised and licensed parts and everything. and. Um, so of course they're going to be more expensive but then that's what you know that's what at the moment that's what I want with this car I want everything to be done properly I just cannot be chasing up some small garage owner over the fact that uh, you know the smell I've still got a smell coming through my uh, my heater every time I turn it on so I think and they've done themselves a decent turn there by literally saying no we're not going to fit this pump because they could have done they said they could have said well you know we've we've fitted the pump for you and oh by the way you needed a, a knuckle joint as well uh, so it said it was 600 quid as it turned out 600 quid and I'm going to be like okay drop your trousers but they didn't they said no we've we traced the problem and the way they said was they said we put a master tech on it which basically, as I say, is, you know, they've got to have a, some sort of getter, haven't they? They told me it needed a pump, and now they're telling me it didn't need a pump. So now I don't know whether it needed a pump, it didn't need a pump, I just don't know. So they've said, no, we've had another guy, another, you know, someone who knows a bit more about it has diagnosed it as a different problem. And that's quite difficult for them to say, isn't it? Difficult for us to say as well. You know, if we say, if we say, well, um, you know, we think that your problem with your dentures is X, and then we fix X and there's still a problem and we say, well, in that case, we think the problem with your dentures is Y. <sighs> you know, the patient then thinks this dentist is crazy, doesn't know what he's talking about. He wasn't right about the first thing. You know, why would I think that he's right about the second thing? Uh, it's difficult to change your mind. And yet, on the other hand, it's sometimes it's dumb not to change your mind. It's seen changing your mind, I think, when the circumstances change is the right thing to do and it can be seen as a strong thing, it's not a weak thing. So anyway, that's, uh, that's it all about professionalism and ethics really in dentistry. Um, I'm more likely to go back to them because they charged me less. Not because they charged me less, but because they could have charged me more and they didn't, they charged me less. And I think uh, that's, that's something I'll take back to the practice, you know. And every time you say to someone, look, um, you know, you, it really needs a crown, but I can patch this tooth up for less. Uh, you know, then they're going to say, right, that's I like this guy. You know, he's not, he's not, and it is a perception, like it or not. For the as dentists, we are sort of perceived as money grabbers because there is this imbalance and there's this uh, lack of um, 
tangibility with what we do. You know, you you have to. Um, the patient has to be happy that you're being honest about what's going on and you can only really be honest about what's going on by being honest you know I had um, had a chap in yesterday he comes to me his wife goes to another practice and uh, they've just told her that uh, she needs three crowns replacing and I just don't even recognize that. I've never known anybody who needed a crown replacing I mean, if a crown falls off, it might need replacing. If it goes decayed around the edges, it might need replacing. If the patient, you know, if the gums recede and expose all the margins, or the patient doesn't like the colour, because the, <laughs> they might need replacing. But just saying that crowns need replacing, uh, three of them, I just don't, uh, I just don't understand it. But then, she's happy where she is, and uh, I'm probably happy where she is as well. If. Um, if that's if that's how she thinks but um, he knows that she's being had and uh, but she doesn't and she's happy and he's not happy because he's the one that's probably paying for it so anyway ethical ethical dentistry is the way forward okay all right nice to talk to you I'll talk to you tomorrow bye